Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Tom Cottingham. I am the CEO of Flyover Media. And Flyover Media, we cover startups, fast-growing companies, innovation, and technology. And today we've got, a, and all, of course, in Flyover Country, and today we've got a perfect combination of all of those things. Um, we have representatives from ProSource and Jeff Reedy from Scale, both of which are fast-growing companies in the Midwest, Indianapolis and Cincinnati, um, both of which are involved in the latest technology, um, both of which were startups. And uh, it's great to have you guys here. Today, we're going to talk about um, hyperconvergence and hyperconvergence infrastructure. And um, we've got Jeff Reedy from Scale Computing, who is entrepreneur extraordinaire. Uh, what, this is your third startup? At least, yeah. Oh, Depending yeah. on which ones we count, yeah. Right, okay. Um, anyway, he's uh, he's been a successful entrepreneur and is currently founder and CEO of Scale, which is on a tear, and they're in Indianapolis. And we also have Ryan and Benny from ProSource, which is a Cincinnati-based company and very much focused on serving um, the Midwest and the region. And um, so between all of us, we hope to give you uh, out there that are attending a fairly good idea of the current state of HCI and how we got here. Um, and all of you who are attending, feel free to give us questions in the chat and one of us will grab them or Kate. And um, we've got Ryan who has a uh, systems engineer, so he can address a lot of the technical stuff. Benny, VCIO, and um, can address a lot of the business cases. And Jeff is just our well-rounded uh, expert on all things. Um, and I'm here so for the Jeff, jokes. You, so. Right? <laughs> um, and so thanks for uh, joining us, guys. And uh, Jeff, if you'd start off and just kind of talk about the evolution of the data centers and H how HCI plays into that and, and what the drivers are right now that are accelerating adoption. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, HCI is a term that we've all been using uh, now going back about 10 years. Um, so, and it's a term that I, I played a role in, in coining um, back 10 years ago, which was intended to be a, a contraction um, to mean uh, converged infrastructure inclusive of the hypervisor. Um, so effectively... Uh, combining the server and the storage aspects all into one, and and so hyperconvergence didn't wasn't meant to be like oh the next version of convergence. It just meant the convergence with the hypervisor, um, okay. and that's you know so that is that has evolved um, into a fairly generic term. Sometimes it does mean uh, convergence with the hypervisor, and sometimes it just means virtual storage. Um, but in any case, right, what we are seeing is um, you know first over the last ten years a consolidation of the traditional data center, right? So traditional data center, you have a networking device, a storage device, a server device, you're seeing those things come together. And then as that extends now into what we're all calling edge computing, uh, which are effectively, you know, any place outside of a data center that you're gonna deploy workloads. Um, this trend of combining what used to be sort of siloed IT into a single platform uh, becomes much more important because out at the edge you have probably fewer resources um, you want to spend less money uh, you need things to be easier to deploy and manage and so that that hci or hyperconverged infrastructure architecture um basically the smaller your deployment gets the more the more obviously logical um that type of deployment becomes okay that makes sense and are there technological developments that are making this more cost effective or more practical right now um, that's that's driving I mean I didn't know about this term 10 years ago um, yeah so is there something going on externally that's driving some of this yeah I mean I, well I can tell you what it what it was 10 years ago and it still applies today which is that you know I at scale computing which has been around for 14 years, um, you know, we started off as a data storage company and I, along with other folks who were in the data storage space, um, you know, would look at the CPU utilization on our storage devices and see that it sat around one tenth of one percent most of the time. 
Right. Um, and you thought, well, my goodness, couldn't we run more more applications on, on this? Now, of course, the going back further in history, um, you know, we used to have a, you know, a, you had a device, you had a server that was a server to storage networking all in one, and the CPU couldn't keep up, right? And so you created a storage device with its own CPU and a, a network switch, which was an x86 box, um, but it was had its own CPU. And so the CPU was the bottleneck. And so that that sort of distributed architecture okay. emerged. Now the CPU, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, the CPU is not the bottleneck, right? That's usually not where we're looking today. Um, and so you can bring these things back together. And, you know, we see, you know, very small devices. We, we deploy a, a, in edge deployments. We deploy a lot on Intel NUX, which were originally, de- you know, released years ago as prosumer sort of set top you know, in your living room kind of boxes. Right. But, you know, when you look at it, it's got a, you know, it could have a, you know, Core i9 CPU, NVMe storage. I mean, I could run a database pushing 50,000 IOPS on that little box um, that was, you know, sort of designed um, for your living room. Well, if, if I need to run an application on a factory floor um, in a manufacturing setting or, you know, in the back of a, uh, of a truck over the road, those smaller form factors make a lot of sense physically. And then you've got enough CPU and storage horsepower to actually make those applications work. Huh, interesting. So, so Benny, this kind of leads to, there are obviously use cases um, for this technology that make more sense than others. And this idea of running, you know, a manufacturing floor or something on the back of a truck um, implies lots of locations that have data. Can you talk about some of the business cases you guys run into where where this is a a no brainer? Absolutely, no, happy to. And and Tom, appreciate you having us on this morning to talk. Um, I'd say you know when we think about business and use cases, a lot of these business or use cases are being driven by really one primary trend or theme um, around digital transformation. So organizations are looking at primarily three questions or three topics when they're making this decision to either move to HCI, consider HCI, or have a conversation with us about HCI solutions. Um, and that's ultimately, you know, simple simplification of their IT approach, um, an overall infrastructure approach, uh, reduction of ongoing costs. So having conversation, conversations about, you know, CapEx and OpEx requirements or abilities by an organization. Um, and then also conversations about, you know, getting out of the hardware business um, or IT business Completely, you know, the, as you mentioned, Tom, a lot of applications for manufacturing firms, right? Their sole job and, and core responsibility is producing a widget and being very good at producing that widget. And so, um, you know, they don't want to necessarily get into or they want to get out of the IT industry as soon as they're hosting hosting infrastructure there on site. Um, they're all of a sudden now, you know, have to support that infrastructure, keep it up and running, um, you know, predict what they're going to need in the future. And so there's all of a sudden this reliance on um, and really this focus on, um, you know, what is next. And so um, getting out of the hardware business and and moving into, you know, a hosted environment and and partnering with an organization or an MSP, like call it ProSource Technologies, it's already made that um, in large investment in the infrastructure and is able to host, host them. Um, you know, it, it all ties back to this digital transformation concept. And so, um, as you mentioned, you know, we have a couple and actually some fantastic business cases, um, one being a large architecture firm that's based here out of uh, Cincinnati. Um, they had an environment, they were running VMware. It was an environment that was built, um, I'd say over, you know, the past 20 years of having kind of a, a legacy IT resource that was there with them for 30 plus years. Um, that IT resource was getting ready to depart the organization, um, sail off into to retirement, right? And he really wanted to set up this environment, this organization for success in the future. So started asking, you know, all the questions of what is next? Um, why are we not in the cloud? Are we able to go to the cloud? Um, is that something that can be supported in our environment? Um, and so they needed redundancy at several locations, right? They had um, they had facilities in about four different cities and one international facility. I mean, this was also a perfect opportunity um, for us to put in a solution and work with them on implementing a solution that was going to allow their internal IT staff of about three to reallocate um, their time and their energy to understanding um, how they can better serve their end users and their internal employees. So kind of that. So um, go ahead. Well, so let's pause right there because this idea of reallocating staff um, 
seems really pertinent right now um, for a couple of reasons, right? One is people are having a hard time hiring and retaining staff. Um, and the other is that people are really looking at their cost structure right now as we, you know, move into, um, you know, a different economic environment than we had a couple of years ago, right? So it would seem that um, this is really compelling to a lot of people to be able to say, either you don't need a full-time DBA or you can take your full-time DBA and train him or her to do something else or, right, upskill them. Um, is, does this become a an important factor in people's decision making? Well, I'd actually like to talk a lot about it. You know, one way you want to understand that is is what is the current IT guy doing today too? You know, you know, it'd be great to have companies have lots of DBA administrators, but they don't. A lot of times they have one guy who's the the jack of all trades. You know, and his job is running around keeping the business running. You know, oh hey, you know we got to do this. Or we got we got to do this. You know, trying to maintain. You know, it, it, the break fix mentality that a lot of IT guys live under because they have the traditional IT elements. You know, the digital transformation concept that Benny was talking about is so relevant because it's, it's a change of mindset of how we've been doing things for the last and even 20 years. You know, we need to change the idea that it's, it's trying to keep things working. We need to be an idea, you know, there's this concept of IT debt and it's real. And you have to, and, and most IT people don't realize it, but they're debt management. That's what they do. They have to maintain getting in front of all these things before they become issues within the community. So as you start embracing different solutions that allow for more automation, more being able to, you know, take away some of those traditional elements, the IT guy then gets out of this, you know, oh my gosh, I have to hurry up. I have to hurry up. He starts to relax. He's like, okay, it just works. It runs now. I've married scale with other cloud-based solutions or on-premise cloud-based, you know, functioning solutions that then allows them to reassociate. Okay, well, Maybe I need to go talk to the sales team and understand what are some of their problems. Oh, these are your problems. They can start working on the business instead of keeping the business just running. And that creates well, a, a really great, really great. And this is, this is something that, that we hear, we're hearing a lot, right? Which is um, leadership in technology and companies is of a generation, right? And it's mostly men. And it's mostly men that went in through programming. Um, and they've got very much of a DIY mentality, right? And so, like everything, they've trained the organization to look at them that way, right? Like, come in on Sunday, reboot the servers, whatever. Um, and they want to be more strategic. They don't have time. Like you said, they're constantly putting out fires. Um, and they're sort of seen that way or, or they perceive that they're seen that way by the rest of the C-suite, right? Like I'm Mr. Fix-It. Um, and what's happening is, is that as that generation is retiring and as we start looking at where we're going to get leadership in the future, it opens up the roles to a lot of people whose primary domain expertise isn't necessarily technology, it's business. Right. And so this enabling technology, I think, is also going to play a really pivotal, important role in how we look at leadership in in technology and organizations. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think um, I will even take it a step further. Right. I think that um, that what we see in IT often reflects, uh, to use your word generationally, what is happening with technology sort of at the consumer level, right? So, so most folks who get involved in IT, you know, grew up using tech of some kind, right? They had, a, they had an affinity towards technology, right? So right. In, the, in the stereotypical example, right, they played video games, right? And they ended up doing tech. Now, when, and I, I'm not afraid of it, I'm still a gamer, right? So I've been playing video games as long as one can have. Right. So when I was a kid, right, to load the video game, at the you know, I booted my Commodore 64, which loaded into basic and I'm typing, <laughs> you know, C load, quote, Pac-Man, comma, eight, comma, one to like play the game. Right. So right. so when when, you know, my generation, right, your generation, Tom, comes into IT like you had to administer a system to get Pac-Man to load. Right. And so you were used to that. You know, now, right, come in, you, you turn on your Xbox, I've got access to a, you know, 
10,000 game library where all I do is click a button and the thing loads. If you then take that person who's interested in tech and drop them into that C64 type of environment, they're like, what the heck is wrong with this? Yeah, like, right, this is right, horrible, sure. Right, and so, you know, what, what you're seeing in the, in the software stacks, right, like Scale and others, is that we're using technology to automate much of that stuff. What Ryan was just talking about, I often call like it's the blue collar element of, of IT, right? The, the car mechanic, right? If you want a car, you could hire a team of mechanics and build a car in your garage. And some people will do that. Most people want to go on the lot and buy a, you know, Honda Civic, right? right. And just get in it and go. Get right? in and, and drive now you're, right. Yeah. And now you're seeing the, the IT solutions move to that. And I think one of the things interesting about the cloud is that there have been two big drivers of why people have gone to the cloud. Driver number one is certain applications make more sense to run in the public cloud. That's an excellent reason to move to the cloud, right? right. Reason number two is I don't want to have to deal with all this infrastructure anymore, so I'm going to move it to the cloud. That's a dumb reason to move to the cloud because the cloud is just another location, right? So if it's going to cost you more to run in the cloud, even though you're not maintaining infrastructure, it's like, I'm afraid of servers, right? I want to get out of that. Well, you know, now you have solutions like scale that can bring that, those applications back on prem um, wrapped in such a way that it feels like the cloud and it's automated and easy. Um, And that, that's why you're seeing demand for this. And this, this trend that we're now all calling edge computing, right? It's, it's happening because this stuff has come together, right? You had things move to the cloud that shouldn't have, you were lacking automation and ease of use on prem. Now that those things are catching up, you're seeing the move for some applications to come back on site. Well, and I mean, Benny, tell me if I'm right on this, but a lot of the feedback we're getting is that the costs of the cloud, however you want to phrase that, um, are A, unpredictable, and B, higher than a lot of people originally thought they would be, right? And so A, you agree with that, then B, so it seems like in a lot of cases, HCI can be a more predictable and less expensive or at least incrementally, you know, your expenses are just going up in chunks that are predictable, um, which is better for budgeting and, and the kind of things that you were talking about earlier. Is that? I think that's a, that's a, that's a fair assessment. I would definitely agree. Um, I think that, you know, whether, whether you're looking at kind of uh, high growth startups or, or small, um, small companies, SMBs um, that are single site, you know, maybe 10, 15 employees, or if we're having conversations with, you know, middle market or even enterprise customers, um, they're thinking about budgeting the exact same way, especially with kind of the economic outlook that, you know, is, I'll call it more or less looming. Um, how can we be the most cost efficient in our decisions today, um, but also forward looking? What's, what's the, you know, the best way to invest in our IT infrastructure? Um, movement to the cloud, um, as you mentioned, can be more expensive in a lot of different instances, but then also you have to look at the cost of disruption to that business as well. So what does that cloud conversion really look like? Is the company best suited for it? That's a, that's a, a conversation and really, um, you know, a thought process or a methodology that Ryan and I take into every conversation. You know, we'd love to be able to simplify every organization, but if it's affecting their core process and the way that they're, you know, effectively delivering a product or a solution to their customers, they might not be at the right point in time to really move to the cloud or move to, you know, a new solution um, because it's going to be highly disruptive to them. So, you know, nailing down timing, I think, is a key consideration around budgeting and, and movement mm-hmm. to a new solution as well. Um, but I, back to the point of, um, you know, the, the startups and these high growth ventures, you know, and comparing that to the budget discussions we're having with these middle market and enterprise customers or prospects, um, you know, there's really a convergence there. And, and I'd say it all, you know, draws back to this HCI and specifically, you know, our conversations with Jeff's team around, you know, the buy as you go benefit of the HCI solution, right? Um, you know, it creates, it simplifies the budgeting process because it's not, 
You know, you don't have to be as forward looking and saying, hey, what am I going to need in three or five years? Um, and if you miss that, you know, on either side of the puck, you, you gauge it high or low, there's a material impact to your business. The buy as you go methodology with HCI and specifically with scale um, has truly been a, a differentiator. Um, and that's, you know, adding your computing memory and storage power as you add additional nodes to your, your primary cluster. I can certainly let Ryan or Jeff speak <laughs> to that, but I think that's a primary consideration and a great talking point as we, we speak about budgeting. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to talk about that because that, that's one of the benefits of the HCI. You know, traditionally with IT, you'd have, you know, and, and Jeff is going to, you know, smile because this is something that scale really hits home is you were, you were, you were making six, seven years investments in hardware and servers for, you know, what is it going to happen? Seven years. seven years is a long time and in, in business. That's, that's an attorney. Even five years is a long time, you know, right. you need to be looking two and three years. And that's, and also, even if you did the mentality in the traditional way of, oh, well, we'll add more. Well, then you're looking at, you know, forklift upgrades sometimes. You're looking at a, a project just to add additional nodes. It's not turnkey. With HCI and the thinking of now of, you know, just like the cloud, oh, you know, their idea of pay as you go, Scale has done that in their own way of, oh, well, if you need more nodes, you just add it. You literally put it in the rack. It takes about five, 10 minutes to integrate to the original node, and you're up and running. So again, changing the mindset of, you know, from traditional ways of thinking, you know, scale is a disruptor in the technology field because of the way it's allowing companies to make better decisions and not waving like a little oracle of like, ooh, how is my business going to be in the next seven years? And I think that's one of the great ways of it. And, and it's really that easy. You know, you put it in right. the rack and you can set it up, you know, and then also going forward, just to abbreviate a little bit, is getting out of that forklift upgrade mindset. You know, always having to replace the whole stack every seven years, you know, instead having inline upgrades where, okay, well, we need to, our, our, our servers are outdating or, you know, even having different types of, that's the other beautiful thing about scale. You can have a Dell server, you can have a Lenovo server. It doesn't have to be the same model or anything for it to work efficiently because of how the software works in the system. So, oh, here's my three new nodes, take the three old nodes out and you're good to go. You know, you, you start getting in more of a kind of a hardware software solution, you know, Hardware as right. a service, even though you're able to do it on a CapEx basis, which that's what CFOs want. Okay. So that makes sense to me, right? And I mean, just sort of logically adding costs in components as you grow, um, as opposed to making these long-term commitments. I get that. Where I'm skeptical just because I'm not technical is that I can really that it's as easy from a technical standpoint as you're making it sound, right? Like, so I'm going to repurpose my DBA and in six months, am I going to be freaking out because I don't have a DBA anymore and it's really not as easy from a technical standpoint as I thought it was. Does that make sense? So purely, I'll, I'll just interject here, purely from a, a business facing, um, you know, C-suite conversation perspective, um, you know, oftentimes the, the feedback that we get after a demo of an ACI platform uh, is there's no way that can't be it. That seems way too easy, too simple. Right? <laughs> okay. and that is so I'm not, I'm not the first person again. that said that, right? No. It's, it's an overwhelming, uh, it's, pri it's the primary feedback we get. So from, I'd say that's, that's the business facing side, which, you know, is music to, to my or, or any of my colleagues years, of course, but um, I'll, I'll certainly let Ryan and Jeff kind of dive yeah. into the, the technical components of what I, makes it so easy. I might start really quick and let Jeff go on, but, you know, when you talk with, you know, providers and, and, and you, you do snapshotting and everything, it, it is, people don't know these technologies, not just scale, but other solutions out there when you pair it with scale too, that, you know, traditionally, oh, it would take us eight hours to find this computer and all these switches and you can just locate within seconds. Or with scale, uh, oh my gosh, we just got ransomware. How quickly can we roll back? You know, I was, I, personal sense why I want to talk to, I was skeptical of scale. You know, I have to tell a story how I became a scale partner. I was selling to my brother-in-law's, um, uh, he owns several hardware stores and we were, we were Dell, we sold the Vertex with Jeff. Jeff, they tried to push the Vertex on Jeff at scale too, which is kind of funny, but you know, their IT guy on site was like, well, we're actually looking at this company called Scale. And I'm like, oh my God, what is Scale? And I, I had to literally go through every single thing to try to figure out how do I differentiate Dell and get it. And in the end, the only way I attacked them, and I don't mind saying it, was their support. I said, well, they, they don't have four-hour mission-critical support. So, so how are you going to get a part there? Now, of course, 
understanding CL now, you don't need a part in four hours because <laughs> there's no single point of failure on the scale. So, so it was interesting how, you know, afterwards, of course, as a company of ours, you know, okay, what is scale? We're going to do our due diligence. So that, that was, uh, that was unbelievable. And then we sat down and we all learned how it works and simplicity is the word. So I'll let Jeff kind of go into that. I know he has a story he wants to tell for that. Oh, I got a million stories I could tell about that, right? I mean, I, you know, 14 years in business and I'm still hearing, I can't believe how easy, right, it, it could be. I, I, I mean, I just had a um, prospect that we were talking to this week who said, well, if um, if it were that easy, wouldn't everyone be using it? And I said, well, I have 30,000 deployments. Like, I don't know how many, like it's uh, now. I'm working again, on to, that. <laughs> right. I mean, to your point, Tom, I mean, here we are in, in flyover country, right? So it seems a little weird, right? Like some company in, in um yeah, Indianapolis has this technology, which is vastly, you know, order of orders of magnitude easier than, say, a VMware and a traditional storage, you know, deployment, right? Um, I had a, you know, we had a, a prospect who um, was a large retailer. They stand up stores, um, you know, retail stores that people walk into, and they have infrastructure in those stores. And it took them about five hours per store. Like when they would stand up a new store, IT guys would walk in, they'd stand up some gear, they'd deploy it. And they said, how fast do you think you could get our app, you know, get your infrastructure in and get applications up and running? And we said, well, under an hour for sure. Right. And they were very skeptical. Um, and so they, they had us come demo it. It took nine minutes, nine minutes. They had the thing deployed in the applications and stuff. Wow. Right. So it's, I mean, it, it, there's a bit of seeing is believing, um, you know, we've got thousands of case studies published because this is the, the skepticism, right? Like, how can it be that easy? And is it really possible that a, you know, a very much IT generalist who is probably, to your point, Tom, earlier, more business focused than tech focused, right? They're, they're the, more technical than maybe the, the person in accounting. But they they still are business focused. Can they actually administer the system if they had to? Uh, and the answer is yes, right? I mean they they can. I mean we, um, you know, we don't even have. I mean, how many how many IT vendors have people interacted with where they have these big expensive multi day come on site training programs, right? Yeah, we, right. <laughs> you know, we send you a, a link to a YouTube video if you care to watch it, right? Like that's the training. So. Um, you know, so it, it really is that easy. And there's a ton of technology that goes behind it. I and mean, we're using artificial intelligence and all kinds of things to make these things happen. And that's really the point, right? It was, it was the, the, the origin of scale was taking technologies, which had generally not been applied to IT management, right? They've been applied in lots of other things, um, yeah. like machine intelligence and applying it uh, in this, this space. When you think about what and, you know, Ryan was talking earlier, right? So, so much of IT is considered break fix. Problem emerges, somebody has to fix it. Problem emerges, somebody has to fix it. What is that? Those are patterns, right? An IT person is coming in, they're looking at, at a table of data and they're trying to pick out patterns. What's really good at figuring out patterns? Computers, yeah, I, yeah. right? And so right. we can use the computer to detect the pattern to fix the problems and thus most problems get fixed on their own. And that's how, that's why it's so easy. So. And that's the self-healing thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, which is yeah, also... and, and the best the best demo for this is we we stand up a, a you know a little three node cluster um, you know and then as we're talking you, here's an application I just pull the power cord on one of them right okay the application was running on server two what happens and then oh it's magically running on server one and nobody did anything um, and then you that's plug crazy. it back in and it moves so yeah so. Uh, someone, I think Ryan mentioned ransomware, and um, I thought we should probably hit on security because that's another huge concern, obviously, with, uh, well, the whole C-suite, but certainly uh, the, the technology side of the C-suite. And so so how does, how does this work with, does, how does it make you more or less secure? So that's a, that is a great conversation. So a lot of people, when they think of cybersecurity, they think of people in, you know, you know, in, in large operation centers, attacking the bad guys. But really what cybersecurity is, 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 you know, mitigating risk. It's all about putting solutions right. in place, making sure things are being updated, which we're going to come back to that, and, and just putting processes in place to make sure. So, you know, going back to traditional stack, you know, you know, again, 
you know, VMware in particular, anybody who's ever done VMware and they said, let's do some updates would probably be like, yeah, let's not and say we did. And that's really was the mindset, you know, you'd have to do policies and templates and then you'd have to set times to run it. And then you'd have to make sure they were compliant, you know, hey, here's my nodes that are not compliant. Here's my nodes that are compliant and, and, and getting it done. And, and a lot of engineers, when they were in that break fix, I was like, ah, I can, I can go a few versions. And then you start getting, you know, with COVID, you get these security risks and they, they would just hit VMware. Like VMware was one they could hit because if they could get VMware, they don't have to break into all your other systems because they'll just encrypt all your, uh, all your VMS databases and then all your VMS data stores. Then you're, then you're done. You know, they got you. And then people who had backup systems on top of uh, VMware that were leveraging virtual types of uh, backup systems were even more in trouble because then they're like, oh, they might have got uh, more than I wanted to. So again, when you start talking about solutions, you know, with cybersecurity, you have to you have to have that mindset of how do I automate updates or how do I make updates simple where I'm going to do them every time and I'm going to keep them updated. Just like the iPhone, for example, it's a great analogy. It pushes the update. You hit the button. It, it says, "Hey, I'm updating. I reboot." And that's how scale is. I mean, literally scale is uh, you go into it. And that's one of the beautiful things about scale too is, you know, a lot of times with doing updates, a lot of people forget about the firmware updates too on VMware, where, you know, right. you have, you know, you have exploits that come out specifically with processors. With scale, because the fact that they sell the hardware, they control the vendor, their updates know what hardware you have. They know what firmware updates you have. It's all inclusive in that update. And you press that button and it migrates the VMs off updates the node and just goes down the list. And literally there's no disruption to the system. You've got, technology is all about making ease to use technology too. And if it's too difficult, people won't do it. So making sure that your critical infrastructure is updated is one of the biggest ways to stop threat actors in the threat environment landscape we are today. Um, another one I can't mention, I'm gonna say, just make sure people turn on MFA. I can't tell you how much, just turn on your MFA. We'll all be safer with MFA. So. But no, that's a, that's a really big thing, you know, and then, you know, just adopt products in general that have automated update systems and ease update, you know. So the updates one, really do make a huge difference on, from a security standpoint. Wait, threat, actor, threat actors aren't, you know, I always like going back to like war games or like, you know, if everybody's seen the movie Swordfish where people are hacking, that's not normally how hackers get in. It's all about an exploit. It's all about, you know, human beings, which is the pretty much 99% of all hacks right. is a human being who didn't update it, didn't close the port, didn't configure the system correctly. And hackers know this. Hackers are all about using those to their examples. So updates, hugely critical. Yeah, I mean, I mean, think about, um, you know, was two, three, I don't know, I lose track of time with COVID, but, um, you know, a couple of years yeah, ago, right. we had the, Intel Spectre meltdown uh, exploits, yeah. right? And it was a, it, and, and this, right? So the discovery of this exploit um, was more like Ryan was saying, this is more of the like, you know, okay, it, it's really complicated. No one knew it was there. Somebody, it, it gets exposed. Well, now fast forward to today, right? It, it's still an exploit. It's still out there. It requires that you have a BIOS update to fix it. How many servers are out there which have not had their BIOS updated in the last four years? A lot, right? <laughs> like most of them. I mean, it, it's just something that people skip, right? And when you, and I don't mean like, oh, okay, it's the server in my data center, right? Because maybe those are, are being maintained a little bit more. But what about that remote office? What about that, you know, oh, it's the third factory that we have in Pennsylvania, and there's two tower servers that sit on the factory floor connected to a couple robots. When's the last time IT walked in there and updated the BIOS? Like the day that it got installed <laughs> is my you know my suspicion, right? And if so they were good enough. <laughs> yeah, so those that yeah, if they if they even did it then, right? And so, you know, these things just just linger and and one of the challenges um, you know, with with edge computing and kind of this motion of more things coming back on prem right, is that any device is a potential attack surface, right, for, for one of these sure. exploits. And so the, you know, one solution, right, and it's a, it, it's a multi-layered approach, but one solution is, well, make sure that whatever you're deploying is easily updatable, right, and it can be updated. And the re one of the reasons that these things don't get updated, even in the data center, is that anyone who's been in IT for more than 10 years has had the experience where they, you know, updated the software or the firmware on, you know, the network switch and the storage stopped working, right? Or the server wouldn't talk to it anymore, right? right. It, it, like, yeah. Okay, it, you know, the break. Cisco, yeah. 
yeah, the Cisco patch worked fine, but it broke the NetApp storage, right? In, you know, accidentally. And then it's a huge mess, right? And so, you know, what we're talking about here with HCI is that you do have this, the combined system. So there's basically one update, right? And it's been, you know, everything, when, when you apply that update, everything's going to work, right? It's all been tested with each other because it feels like one update, even if, even if it might be a kernel update versus a storage update or whatever underneath, right? It's been tested as one unit. Hmm. So what are the downsides, guys? I mean, certainly there's got to be use cases where it just doesn't make sense or are there? I will, I will start, you know, most new startups, I try to push them for not doing server infrastructure. You got to remember, you know, scale is for running server, servers, you know, running traditional infrastructure servers, basically. So new startups, I, I like to tell them, hey, try to stick with SaaS services. Try to build your company with Office 365, Azure AD. Don't try to get a line of business software or so you have to need it. And, and that's what I talk to clients a lot about. You know, hey, I want to move to the cloud. Great. What's your line of business software? Because your line of business software, you know, Jeff was talking about workloads. There are workloads that make sense to be in the cloud and there are workloads that just don't. And your line of business software and how a company functions is what will dictate that movement. I mean, what my job is at ProSource is we literally sit there and listen to a company operate. You know, hey, talk to me, Lily, talk to me about the sales process. You know, tell me how you're putting the order in. You know, you know how are you transferring that? Are you guys using your piece? Talk to me about that. Talk to me about your flow of business. I can't tell you how many times that even IT people who've been with companies for six years will tell you, oh yeah, well, that's above my pay grade. I, I don't know how they operate that, but, but that runs on your infrastructure. You should know how that business process works because technology should work around a company, not fit it into a box and be like, hey, let's run it. So can there be a downside to scale? It's not really a downside to scale. It's a downside of how your company operates, whether scale is a good fit, in my opinion. Right. Okay. Right. okay. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, you're, you, we've moved beyond, you're not going to run exchange servers on site anymore, right? Like email is the most obvious thing. It makes way more sense in the cloud, right? Everything is interoperating with the internet and, and a very simple, this is a, a simplistic way to think about your, your business processes, but I, I like to use it as an example. Um, right. If you're you have a business, maybe you're a manufacturer of some kind. Right. Um, consider that there's two kinds of applications. Right. If the Internet connection went down, are there applications which you still need to be able to run? Right. There's going to be some. Right. If the Internet connection goes down, do you need email? Well, no, because you, you, you wouldn't have anywhere to send it. Right. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Yeah. Right? right. On the other hand, if the Internet connection goes down. Do the robots in the factory still need to run? I suspect they do, right? On the other hand, right, what if the power goes out, right? If the power goes out, do the, you know, robots at the factory still need to run? Probably not, right? Factories turned off, right? Right. Would the sales guys like to be able to hop on their phone and sit in their car and still close deals? Probably so, right? So you can think about how the, you know, where the application goes. And, you know, when we talk about, about edge computing, where things are evolving to is not so much the traditional, oh, we've got racks and racks of gear on site and running all these applications. There'll be use cases where that is true, but in, in most cases, we're not talking about that. But you know, I, I talked to a, a quick service um, restaurant chain earlier this week, and they said, okay, we, well, you do everything in the cloud. And I said, oh, okay, so, so what do you have in the, in the, you don't have anything in the stores at all? Nope, we don't run any applications in the store. Now, what um, what's your point of sale system? Oh, well, it's NEC that runs in the store. Um, you run <laughs> video cameras. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's video in the store. Um, I like do you doing for security? Oh, we have, we have sonic wall firewalls. Where are they in the store? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so so we've already identified three applications that are running locally. Locally, and right? In, right. And in this case, right, a, an HCI stack like Scale could simplify all of those applications into one platform, right? But they're mentally, they're not even thinking of it as a server, and that's okay, right? It's just that those things, they're not thinking of it in the traditional server sense, but, you know, that security, that video surveillance, that point of sale system, those are applications which are going to run local, and, and everybody's going to have something like that, right? Even the most sort of cloud-centric, um, you know, company, unless you're running everything off of somebody's cell phone, right, there's likely to be some things on-prem. And in, in other cases, right, some industries are going to be heavily on-prem. Right. I mean, right. And manufacturing you know, is one that we'll talk about a lot, but, you know, very much so. Right. Many manufacturers have requirements that 
Um, I've seen them written. If if civil unrest breaks out around the factory, they still need to be able to make widgets, right? Well, okay, maybe you know, running everything in the cloud is not going to be what they want, right? So it's a combination. Right. The cloud is just another location, right? And you should run the application wherever it makes the most sense. How many conversations do you have with an IT guy and you're like, you know, like Jeff just said, and they're like, oh, no, you just miss it. You have to understand the business. Without understanding the business and really diving into it, you can't be, oh, yeah, we don't need you. You don't know where that top technology is going to take you anymore. It, there's so many solutions out there now that nobody knows them all. And you have to really... In order to pick the, I always say, I always tell everybody, the path becomes evident. The more you talk about how business runs, the technology path will become evident. Yeah, it kind of reveals it. itself, right? Yeah, it if you ask the right itself. questions. You got to get right. the data. You got to get the data. From a, Tom, I'll, I'll cut in here. From an, an operator standpoint, you know, there's really there's not a lot of ways I'd say that that uh, an operator um, or somebody seeing the C suite can push back and say, hey, I don't see the advantage or the benefit of moving to an HCI platform. One of the more interesting conversations we did have uh, was with an organization who did push back and say, you know, um, that vendor consolidation or vendor unity under, you know, being an MSP supporting uh, the uh, scale or HCI platform um, scared them. You know, all of a sudden that vendor consolidation means what happens if a pro source or a scale goes away? Um, that was obviously remedied with an assurance that we're large at scale organizations and we're not going yeah, right. away, right? Um, and so, and that's something that, you know, I think primarily plays in, in the benefit side of the court uh, for HCI and, and MSPs partnering with, you know, HCI providers like scale. So it was a bit of a different approach that this operator took and, and you know, I'd say paranoid in nature and saying, hey, you know, consolidation, one throat to choke, um, that scares me. Um, but in all reality, it's it's an added benefit. Um, we just had to reposition thinking there and, and ultimately, you know, they were on board. Yeah, one, one thing I'll add too, right? I, it, it sometimes, I mean, maybe, maybe I'll offer a little bit of a reframing, right? In terms of how to think about the cloud versus the data center versus the edge, right? When the term cloud computing came out, um, it was not intended to mean a great big data center in Seattle. Right. That's not what the cloud was supposed to be, that we had big data centers. Right. The cloud right. meant ubiquitous computing resources, right. Computing resources wherever you needed them. The, you know, the cloud, meaning the public cloud and the traditional data center and now edge computing. Edge computing is basically completing the vision of what the cloud really is supposed to be, which is there's computing where you need it. You run the applications where you need it and you you shouldn't be thinking about you know, as a, as a business person, right? You shouldn't be thinking about, oh, does this application, do we, should we go cloud or should we go on-prem, right? Any more than a, a business person should be thinking about, should we buy Fords or Hondas, right? Like that's, right. you know, let somebody like ProSource figure that out, right? Like that's what they do. Tell them what your business problems are. They'll bring the right solutions. Um, and if I'm lucky, we're part of that solution. And sometimes we're not because that that company doesn't need something like scale, right? And these guys will do it and not, and they're, they're your trusted advisor, right? And they can answer the, the Honda versus Ford question for you. Um, and then you just run your apps, run your business, right? Well, that's, I mean, and that's what people want to do, right? They want to run their business. Um, even senior leadership in technology wants to be much, they want to sit down with, their CMO, right? And talk with her about what her needs are going to be now and five years from now. Um, and so I, it's the answer to a lot of problems. It sounds, I mean, it just, it really does seem like that. So you've got, it sounds, you know, we have the, the different elements in place. Is there another inflection point that we see coming in the next couple of years that will change the landscape or, or is it going to be more incremental kinds of improvements for the next, uh, you know, for the foreseeable next two to three years? Well, I mean, I, I don't know the next two, three years, but one thing that Jeff said that I, I want to, you know, you know, something that I think is coming that I like to tell everybody now is, you know, and Jeff kind of hit on it, you know, the generation was IT gamers, you know, that's, that's who our IT people are, you know, but, you know, if you think about it, it's very unregulated what an IT guy is. And with the DOD and, you know, with them pulling out new regulations, you know, I see IT becoming very regulated industry, just like lawyers, just like doctors, you know, you know, even car mechanics have certifications to work on HVAC, HVAC has licensing, you know, I very much see, you know, I think they just passed a law down, I think they just passed a law down in Louisville, actually, the first law to start having MSPs 
and computer start registering with 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 the with the state. You know, I, I think people need to be mindful that you know regulations until it's actually implemented means nothing. By the way, uh, just something to right. think about. Like I, I've always heard that. Well, everybody's gonna have to do this, and then at the last minute they pull the plug. So be mindful of that too that it can go. But you know, just know that you know you need to start thinking more. You know, hey. You know, going back to the car mechanic, too. I love that with Jeff when he talks about the car mechanic. You know, are you really going to hire all these car mechanics that are only going to work on your car and only see your car for the next five years in your garage? Or are you going to take it to a shop where they're seeing the latest cars and always updating the cars? You know, that's something you got to keep in mind, too, that, you know, it's always been the tradition to have, you know, IT guys, but that's not the one you want in your company anymore. You want the people that are application focused. You want the people that are you know, look, or know how your business runs. It understands that, hey, there's a problem here and I need to go talk to somebody who understands technology to help me fix that problem, not try to fix it yourself. And, and that's just that, that's that mentality we have to change in the industry over the next three to five, even 10 years that, you know, as things get better, as things just work, it's not about making it work anymore. It's about making sure it's the right solution. We're moving forward in the right direction. I think Ryan brought up a great point just around, you know, regulatory compliance concerns or, or even further implications as we look out into the future. Um, you know, we do quite a bit of work with organizations that, um, you know, are in the government contracting space. And so as a result, they have NIST 800-171 or CMMC compliance standards that they must meet in order to deliver their solution, maintain their contracts. Uh, of course, there's all types of cybersecurity policy procedure um, that's built around, you know, that specific engagement. But going further, um, you know, the vast majority of, of threat actors um, and, and the pure volume of attacks are targeting the SMB market. Because there's a recognition by you know, foreign nation states um, and, and threat actor groups that the SMB marketplace is really what drives the US economy um, and, and you know, uh, is reinvesting into the community um, and is employing um, the folks down the street. And so uh, the recognition of that has shifted you know, the focus away from a lot of you know, large hospital organizations, Fortune 500 organizations, and targeting SMB uh, marketplace, as well as, you know, of course, the, the unsophistication um, that the vast majority of the SMB uh, marketplace has from a, an IT infrastructure or cybersecurity perspective today. So um, just to kind of comment further on Ryan's point, um, I think you know regulation around um, and a heightened focus around what MSPs are delivering um, to SMBs uh, in, in the marketplace, but also just overall standards for, for doing business um, and being rated as, as a great place to work and a, and a great place to, to buy products or solutions from. Uh, there's going to be IT and cybersecurity you know, implications down the road. All right, we are coming towards the top of the hour. Do we have any questions? We've covered a lot of stuff. I I feel like we've covered some useful ground here. I did Kate, get a private seen... message uh, from someone who asked if Jeff would mind sharing his views and perspectives around the Broadcom uh, acquisition of VMware. Oh, yeah. sure. seriously, he planted that question. <laughs> I did not. I was my wife. My wife must be on here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, so, um, you know, for years and years, right, this goes back to the earlier question about, um, or the earlier comment made, that it seems too easy, right? I would have customers say, or prospects say, well, this looks awesome, but hey, we're just going to stick with VMware, right? In the vein, the old adage in IT is nobody gets fired for buying IBM, or at least used to, right. right? Not get fired by IBM, right? When I started scale, my list of, and this goes back a long time, right? I mean, Sun was still a company, right? Wow. EMC was, you know, independent, right? And so, you know, it, it, they, they go away. I mean, the, the landscape changes. And so here you have Broadcom buying VMware. I'm like, okay, well, how did sticking with VMware work out for you, right? Probably not too good, right? I, you know, what Broadcom is going to do with VMware is, is, you know, up to speculation. But I can assure you they did not buy VMware to invest in R&D. Right. That is not the Broadcom business no. plan. Right. So, you know, it's an opportune time to think about, all right, maybe there is a different, you know, a different way of doing things. Right. And so it's a huge opportunity for scale. Um, you know, I've been positioned as a VMware alternative from day one, um, among other things. But, you know, first and foremost, VMware is sort of the operating system of the old way of doing things and scales a new way to do it. So um, happy to, uh, you know, I, I mean, I was probably. Other than Michael Dell, I think I was the second happiest person on the day that that Broadcom uh, thing got <laughs> announced. I saw somebody in the chat comment, you know, look at what they did with Symantec, right? Exactly, right? What happened to pricing? What happened to support? What happened to that product? You know, it went in Symantec in 
uh, CRN computer reseller news um, ranks, you know, vendors every year and Symantec actually went from the number one uh, endpoint security vendor in, I don't remember which year, 2018, six, whatever it was, the year before the Broadcom acquisition to dead last in one year. Really? Right, in that survey. So, wow. um, and by the way, Scale's already ranked number one for, uh, for HCI. So we are <laughs> we're already taking VMware's butt, but um, yeah, but anyway. So really quick, Jeff is being, you know, Jeff and his team really coined hyperconvergence. Everybody else stole it from him for the most part. You know, they they were the first ones to take the simplicity out of storage and everything. And everybody else just kind of stole it from. Him. If you ever listened to that, I had a great opportunity to talk to their CTO. Uh, he, if you ever get a chance to get any of his webinars and how he describes the technology, it, it, it's very interesting because, you know, it's it's. Again, I, I we we always vet our solutions, so we went right to the top to talk to the CTO there and talk about what makes it differential. But that's another good one. They they coined hyperconvergence. So I'm gonna give it to Jeff. <laughs> well, that's a that's pretty cool, actually. Um, yeah, and you know, you're an instant success after 14 years, right? <laughs> overnight, overnight success story. That's overnight right. success, right? Um, I mean, you've been pounding away at this for a long time. Um, any final thoughts as, as we wrap up? You know, I'll, I'll make one quick comment, right? Since we're talking about the history of, of HCI, right? A lot of times these sorts of new technologies are thought about in the context of, okay, well, that's what, that's what the Fortune 500 gets to do, right? And then I, I'm going to get the riffraff from them, right? And, and so many vendors over so many years have done exactly this, right? There's a, the latest version is priced and packaged in a way for that, that Fortune 500, and what the, the mid-sized company gets is the lesser version at a somewhat lesser price, even though they may have needed all those features anyway, right? They get something like that. Uh, HCI is very different. I mean, the, the, while, while Scale's got customers globally now, the, the core of HCI and all this technology originated in servicing um, mid-sized companies, right? That, that cons a construction company, the architecture firm in Cincinnati, a construction company in Chicago, those sorts of things. Right, and it's because when you got into those environments, um, the they typically had smaller IT staff, meaning they had more general. They they had to be more generalists, right? They weren't specialists. They were generalists, right. and so the automation and the ease of use that HCI brought them was hugely beneficial. Right. Well, now that's now that applies sort of all over the place. So if folks are listening to this and they're thinking, oh, well, I'm not Procter and Gamble, so I wouldn't I wouldn't use this. That's not the case at all, right? I mean, we have, you know, no. In fact, it's the opposite, really. Right. I mean, that's right. You get state of the art technology, but at a scale. What a great name for a company, but you know, at the scale that's appropriate for your organization, right? I mean, I it seems to me that it's a fairly significant. My brain isn't working fast enough to come up with a different phrase and paradigm shift, but it really is a leveling out of the technology landscape, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So if we look at at my customer, you know, I have customers who have deployed thousands of scale on thousands of systems. I have customers who have deployed scale on one system. They are running exactly the same software stack, one hundred percent the same software. Right? That's crazy. One thing, to know, awesome. yeah, one thing to just add really quick at the end that, you know, Jeff was talking about and, you know, he's saying it right there is, you know, I, I always like to use the word complacency and I, and I, and I, I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, so I always, you know, our concept is complacency kills, uh, but okay. in business, it's, Which, very, it, it, <laughs> literally. Well, it, it, it's, it's very similar though. Like, you know, Jeff made the comment, well, that's what we've always done. You know, you, you have to constantly be looking at the technology. It's always changing, you know, you know, what we, how we do things 10 years ago, how we do things next year. I mean, there's nothing, you know, you go to some companies that make widgets. They've made the same widget for 200 years. You know, there, there's a company down Cincinnati. Uh, Atkins and Pierce is a great company. They, they are, they've been making the same thing for over 200 years, which is twine, just, just doing braiding. And, and it's crazy. Right. But the reality is they still have to change all the back end stuff. And, 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 and that's the same thing with us. You know, with companies, I can't tell you how important it is to, to have outside have outside people come in and talk, you know, listen to how your technology, you know, understand the solutions and how they can change. Because if you just keep doing the same thing, then you're going to get complacent. And as you get complacent as a business, eventually you're going to get hit with something like, oh, wow, we should have been working on this five years ago with our technology. Now, now we're just, we're, we're, we're so far in debt, how are we going to get out of this? Please constantly have 
people, you know, constantly have the conversation internally. Hey, are we in the right direction? Are we doing the right things? Is there a better way of doing it? I can't stress that enough. How many times I sit in meetings with companies where, hey, do you guys know what this server does? No, we just leave it on. I'm afraid to touch it. I really don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm afraid to touch it. It'll blow up. And, that, and that's right. the mindset for some companies. They, they just have servers or pieces of equipment that literally are hanging on the wall because nobody knows what it is. You know, you got to keep that clean, just like a house. You got to keep your house clean. You got to get the old stuff out. So again, constantly for companies is make sure you're questioning things. Make sure you're staying relevant. And and to, to dovetail off that, it's, you know, the uh, comment that Jeff made earlier around, you know, the fact that the ProSource or any other MSP, they're not going to bring every single organization that they partner with um, or every organization that they bring in as a customer straight to the scale platform. It, it, I would be wary of any MSP or any tech consultant um, that is, you know, highly focused on two or three solutions within their stack um, because it's not going to be likely not going to be the right size solution. Yeah, they're trying to fit you into one of their boxes. It's not really working very they're, well, they're is it? Really to be a consultative approach where they're leaving you with actionable and deliverable data um, that is not given to you as an obligation to do business with that MSP or pro source, right? You need to be given the data. It's your data. Um, our job is really to synthesize that data and make a recommendation. Well, all of these things are going to enable tech leadership to do what they keep telling us they want to do, right? Which is a lot of what Ryan was saying, right? Focus on the business processes and, you know, get down to basics from a business standpoint. Don't let the tech drive it. Um, and you don't have to have DIY, you know, people who know how to program in COBOL to be running, right? Running uh, your IT for your organization anymore. Um, and you can spend the time then thinking about and building relationships with the line of business people as opposed to um, worrying about, you know, when you're going to get your next server delivered. Um, so, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's kind of a perfect time for this, it seems to me, with this generational shift and the, the need for the ubiquity of technology to be um, more focused on business outcomes um, and less on the tech. That's where people want to be spending their time. Let you guys worry about the tech. Right. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And uh, if you don't subscribe, subscribe to Flyover Future. And uh, thanks again, guys. It was great uh, spending time with you. Thanks, thanks, Tom. Tom. thanks for your time, Tom.